Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Ashok. This video is the part of scenario based Salesforce interview questions and answers series in which I already have created one video and covered many scenario based questions. So if you want to learn about them, then please check out that video and you can find link in description. All right. So today in this video, we will see more scenario based interview questions, which are generally asked in most of the Salesforce interviews and also asked to me in many big MNC interviews and we will cover questions related to Apex, Asynchronous Apex, Admin Customization, Integrations and LWC and also I have already created a LWC specific interview questions and answers series in which you will find multiple videos which covers from basic to advanced LWC interview questions. So if you want to learn only LWC related questions and answer then you can refer those videos and you can find link in description. Okay. So let's start and discuss on today's first question. All right. So this question is related to triggers and this question asked to me recently in one of the big MNC interview. So what this question says, assume we have 10 manage package installed in our org and all they have triggers on account object and each trigger has 10 SOQL queries. And I'm also creating one custom trigger with five SOQL in our org. So the question is, Will this scenario work or throw too many SQL queries 101 error? So let's understand this question again. So as per this question, we have 10 managed package installed in our org and each package has one trigger on account object and contain 10 SQL queries in each trigger and one custom object is also created with 5 SQL queries. Now interviewer wants to know like this transaction will work or throw too many SQL queries error because you know in synchronous transaction, we have 100 SOQL limit, but if you see here, we have 10 managed package and each package has one trigger and has 10 SOQL queries and also we have created one custom trigger. So here we have total 105 SOQL queries in single transaction and we have limit of 100, right? So interviewer just want to check your deep knowledge about managed packages and governor limits. So I hope you got the question. Now let's see how you can answer this question. So as described in question, we have 10 managed packages and as per Salesforce documentation, each certified managed package that has passed security review for app exchange will get their own set of limits for most of the per transaction limits like SOQL, SOSL and DML. So in other words, if you are installing a certified managed package, then they will have their own governor limits for SOQL and DML. So in this case, our transaction will perfectly work because we have installed managed packages and each package will have their own 100 SQL query limit. But if we have installed non-certified or unmanaged package, then they would share governor limits from our old total governor limits. So in case of unmanaged packages, it won't work, but with managed packages, it will perfectly work. Okay. Now, one cross question can also be asked by interviewer. Like do you know which all per transaction limits will be same for whole transaction including managed, unmanaged and custom code? Then we can say all per transaction limits count separately for certified managed packages expect total heap size, maximum CPU time, maximum transaction execution time, maximum number of unique name spaces. Okay. So these limits are same for entire transaction regardless of how many certified managed packages are running in the same transaction. But SOQL, DML, SOSS and other per transaction limits will be separate. Okay. Now next we have, assume we have two triggers on same object. One is created in managed package and another one is custom trigger. Now I want to call custom trigger prior to managed package trigger. So how can I achieve this? So we all know that order of execution we can't control if you have multiple triggers on same object in same org. But what if, if we have triggers in managed package? So in this case, what will be the behavior? Then your answer should be same. Whether you have custom or managed package trigger, order of execution can be anything. We can't control that. So same behavior will be here. Like we can't call our custom trigger prior to managed package. Like we can't do any kind of setup. Okay. So this is a simple question. Just added managed package to test your confidence. Okay. Now next we have, can we edit Apex triggers, classes and visual force pages in production environment? Then you can say, 
yes we can edit visual force pages in production environment but this is not true for apex classes and triggers we can't edit them in production environment like salesforce doesn't allow to write apex code in production environment now let's say interview asked you one cross question like then can we disable a trigger in production environment so in our non production environment we can disable our inactive trigger by going into setup and apex triggers and over there we will find a checkbox to mark trigger active or inactive once we edit the trigger but you know we can't edit triggers in production environment because this is the part of apex and salesforce doesn't allow to write apex in production okay then again interviewer can ask another cross question to you like then what is the best way to disable a trigger in production with minimal changes then we can say we have to redeploy our trigger after deactivating in lower orgs using deployment tools like ant migration chain set workbench or salesforce cli but this approach requires redeployment and you know redeployment requires test cases and code coverage and it is difficult to pass test cases without executing triggers and let's say we have another scenario to disable multiple or all the triggers then it will be very difficult to redeploy all the triggers so in this case what we can do we can use custom settings or metadata settings to control logic execution of trigger so if you can see in this image i have defined a custom setting with the name of trigger settings and added a custom field ejective and i am using this custom setting here to check trigger is active or not so if you will have false value in this ejective field then i am returning from here only and if it will be true then whatever logic we have written over here that will be executed so in production environment whenever we want to disable trigger execution then we can go into custom settings and change the value of this ejective field okay so this is how we can disable code execution of trigger with no or minimal changes and you know this is the part of best practices as well so we should always follow this approach okay now next question is related to workflow rules and this same question was asked to me in one of the india based big mnc so let's discuss what this question says on opportunity object we have two active workflow rules created and criteria for workflow rule one is if amount is greater than equals to 100 then we have to give 20% discount and as per second workflow rule if opportunity amount is less than 100 then we have to give 20% flat discount now if we are going to insert new opportunity with opportunity amount 100 then what will happen here and what will be the final opportunity amount now the first question is which workflow will rule get executed because you know we can't define order of executions for workflow rule as well if we have multiple workflows on same object but if you will see rule criteria here first workflow rule will execute when amount is greater than or equals to 100 so this criteria is meeting because we are inserting opportunity amount 100 right so what it will do after execution it will add 20% discount so final amount will be 80 dollar and now if you will see rule criteria for second workflow which says amount is less than 100 so now let's suppose if our first workflow rule get executed first then amount will be 80 dollar then criteria for second is also fast and we have to give 20 dollar flat discount then amount will be 60 dollar right but is it correct answer no because there is no connection between workflow rules and there is no impact on each other while execution but if you check reevaluate checkbox then this will be correct answer because reevaluate means your all workflow entry criteria will be rechecked with updated value and you know in that case our second workflow rule criteria will meet and value will be 60 dollar okay now next we have too many dml statements one error so what is the reason of this error and what will be the solution okay so generally we used to see too many dml statements 151 error because we have 150 per transaction dml limit and if we try to run more than 150 dml statements in a single transaction then too many dml statements 151 error occurs but what is this too many dml statements one error and why it occurs okay so the reason is 
when we try to perform DML operations from caseable true method, then this error occurs. Like you can see here in this image, this is a aura enable and caseable true method, and we are performing update operation into this. And now, if we call this method from wire decorator or with imperative approach, in both cases, it will throw too many DML statements one error because you know we can't perform DML operations in caseable true method. So to avoid this error, we need to perform DML operations from non caseable method. Okay. Now next we have can we insert user role and account record in single transaction? Then answer will be no. If you will try to insert, then you will get mixed DML operation error. So now let's discuss what is the reason behind this. Because if you will perform DML operations on setup and non setup objects in single transaction, then this is not allowed in Salesforce because some objects affect the user's access to records in the org. For example, let's say we are removing permission set assignment for user and user profile does not have account update permission, but due to that permission set, user was able to update accounts record. Now if you are going to perform both operations in single transaction, like we are removing the permission sets and updating the account in same transaction, then this will be difficult for Salesforce to manage because technically after removing the permission set, user is not allowed to update account record, right? So to avoid the security and permission issue, Salesforce does not allow to perform DML operations on setup and non setup objects in single transaction. But now let's say interviewer ask you for any alternative way, then you can say to use future method because you know future method is the part of asynchronous apex and asynchronous apex will execute in different thread or in different transaction. So what you can do, you can create a future method and you can write DML operation for one of the object into that. So due to asynchronous nature, it will execute in different transaction and we won't get any kind of error. So if you can see in this image, in this update account method, I am updating account and to perform DML operations on user object, I am calling this future method insert user and over here in this future method, I can write code to insert user record or any other setup object record. Okay. So in nutshell, we can't perform DML operations on setup and non setup objects in single transaction and to perform both, we can use future method because that will complete in another transaction. And if we talk about what all setup objects we have, then we can say user, user roles, territory, user territory, permission sets, permission sets, assignments, and many others are there. You can refer Salesforce official website to know more. Okay. Now next we have, tell me the use cases when and why we should use future methods. So first use case we have already discussed in last question to avoid mixed DML error and to perform DML operations on setup and non setup objects, we can use future methods. And next use case we have to perform long running tasks. So as discussed in last slide, future methods are the part of asynchronous apex and asynchronous apex execute in different thread. So if we have any requirement that we don't want to perform in current thread by any region, for example, you want to make call out or you have to perform a long running calculation and output of that calculation is not required to show now, then why we should delay current user request or show loader for long time. So in such kind of situations where we do not want response immediately, there we can use feature methods because if we use feature method, then that calculation will done in different thread. So current thread will quickly get free and user will have response instantly. And also with asynchronous apex, we get higher governor limits and CPU time. Like normally we have 100 SOQL per transaction limit, but with asynchronous apex, we can run 200 SOQL queries and also heap size is 12 MB with higher CPU time. So if you have a long running task where you require more SOQL limit or more heap size, then you can use feature methods. And next we have to make call out for trigger. So as we know, we can't do callout from Apex triggers, but with the help of future methods, we can make callouts like we can write callout code in future method and call that future method trigger. Okay. Now next question we have, 
can we create a validation rule to prevent record delete then a straightforward answer is no validation rules works only with record save and if you require to add any validation on record delete then you can go with apex triggers or now i guess you can use record triggers flow as well that should also work for you okay now next question we have suppose i am inserting 300 records and on 66 record i got an error then what will happen will our records insert or failed all right so we have two approaches in salesforce to perform dml operations first is dml statements and another one is database methods so it's depend on the approach which approach you have used while record saving so if you are using dml statements as like this image like insert then collection of the records then it will roll back whole transaction and nothing will insert into database and also will throw error because dml statements doesn't support partial operation so if you got error in any of the record insertion then everything will be rolled back and no one will be inserted and if you are using database methods as like this image like this database dot insert then it will support partial operations but it depends how you configure this because here in first parameter you can provide records collection and second parameter is saying all or none so here if you provide true then it will behave like dml statements i mean if error occurs in one record then all records will be failed but if you pass false in this second parameter then it will support partial execution and insert all the valid records so let's say we got an error in 66 record and if all other records are valid then it will insert rest 299 records and now after insertion if you want to check like which all records are inserted or which all are failed then that we can check by iterating this results because database methods will return all the record wise details as a save result and now we can iterate this results and check which one is passed using this each success method so if record is successfully inserted then this method will return true so we can write success logic here and somehow it got failed then it will return false so that logic we can write over here in else part and here with the help of this get errors method we can get all the errors with the record and this get errors method also return the collection of errors because we may have multiple errors on same record so we can iterate this collection and get all the errors with the error status code okay so in nutshell it depends on the approach which we are using to save our records okay now next we have can we call future method anyhow in beige classes then a straightforward answer is no we can't call any future method in beige classes directly but if you have to call it anyhow then you can call it via web services like what you can do you can create a web service and call future method into that and now in our beige class you can call that web service so directly there is no way to call future methods in beige classes but with the help of web services we can call it if really required okay so that's it for this video in next video i will cover more scenario based interview questions so please like this video and subscribe my youtube channel and please also share your feedback in the comments that will help me to create more videos okay so thanks for watching this video i will see you in next video